This is part four of lecture one. In this final part of the lecture, we're going to talk about the core concept of social psychology. By now, I think you understand how, what si social psychologists want to know. We want to know why people do what they do. So we want to understand human behavior. So what determines our behavior? At the core, there's one basic principle, and the founding father of social psychology, you see him over here, is Kurt Lewin. Um, he already came up with, with this idea of uh, to understand, uh, fin uh, finally understand uh, human behavior. And this is the formula that he uses. So here you see the formula, and the B stands for behavior. And behavior is a function, that's the F, of the person, P, times environment, E. So everything we do is basically uh, can be understood in terms of who that person is, the personality of that person, and the environment in which this person finds him or herself. And both concepts, concepts are e equally important in understanding uh, human uh, behavior. Um, so let's, let me give you some examples of how we can see um, how this, this formula eventually plays out. So the situation and the environment um, are uh, uh, super important. So in the situation, if you find, find yourself growing up in a situation, in an environment uh, in which you have plenty of opportunities, so in this area it would be for all the people that live on the left-hand side uh, from the highway, you see... This is definitely the more wealthier part of this area, right? You see uh, swimming pools, it's very green. And uh, you can uh, understand that if you grow up in this part, the, the likelihood for you to grow up in a stressful environment is a, is a bit lower than if you grow up in the right hand of the screen, on the right side of the highway, in which um, the circumstances are just uh, harsher. It's uh, m much more difficult to uh, develop yourself, to get good education, to get uh, uh, good foods, uh, and to grow up into you know, uh, an individual in which you can feel like you can reach uh, your full potential. So where you grow up, this environment already is very impactful uh, in understanding um, uh, how humans uh, eventually develop. Uh, but also, um, even if we grew up and our environment shaped us, we can find ourselves on a daily situation in, in uh, different environments. So, for example, we know that um, we have a higher chance of showing um, sort of a good moral behavior when we're in the presence of others. And you can see this, for example, uh, in a public, wa a public washroom, that people actually wash their hands more thoroughly and better and longer if other people are present in the washroom as well, compared to when they are there alone. Uh, and also, if you think about your own behavior, that's probably very depending on your surroundings yourself. So uh, let's imagine you go out uh, on a certain night with your friends and you find yourself uh, enjoying a couple of beers and having a laugh. You probably showed very different behavior on the very first night you're meeting your parents-in-law or when you uh, are watching uh, this, uh, this lecture right now. You're probably not behaving in the same way. So we are all very much aware of the fact that even though our personalities are relatively stable, the aspects of our personality, uh, uh, personalities that stand out really depend on the situation that we find ourselves in. So the situation impacts a person. It changes a person. It changes our behavior. But in the same way, the situation can also uh, be impacted by one person. And you can see this on the video that's in the screen right now. What you see is Commemoration Day on the 4th of May in 2010. So each year on May 4 in the Netherlands, we uh, uh, grieve for the people that died or killed uh, in wars, uh, in the Second World War, but also in other wars. And this is um, a moment in which a lot of people gather in Amsterdam at Dam Square. Uh, you see it here. And every Everybody is always very calm and the intention is that we are all quiet and uh, stay calm uh, for a, a short moment of time in which we really contemplate what these people went through and, and pay respect to the people that are killed. And everybody is doing that and everybody is, is, is uh, uh, behaving in the same way, being quiet. And then all of a uh, sudden, the whole situation changed for all these thousands of people at Dem Square because one person started screaming. And you can see it happening here. And what you see is that the whole situation drastically changes based on the behavior of one individual. So one person in a situation can change the behavior of everybody. So you have a lot of power if you find yourself in a social situation 
uh, as well. So the situation has power over you, but you also have power over a situation and you're dependent on the behavior of others in a certain situation. Okay, so we know as social psychologists that you can never look at behavior of a person only by looking at the person. You always have to consider the environment, the situation this person is in. But still, if something really extreme happens, we still often wonder what happened here? Is this a person or is this the situation? For example, um, we ask this question if something really horrible happens. Uh, for example, if people are abused uh, and sometimes even killed when they are imprisoned. Um, in Abu Ghraib uh, prison, for example, uh, in Iraq, um, there were a lot of violations uh, uh, against uh, the prisoners that were really, really extreme. And you can wonder, so what happened there? Were these guards just, just evil? Were they really brutal? Or was it the situation that triggered this behavior in uh, this Abu Ghraib uh, prison? Also, when something happens that shocks us all, uh, if, uh, there's uh, if there's an attack, for example, uh, what happened uh, in, in Paris uh, on uh, Charlie Hebdo, there was uh, an attack by terrorists. And you might be thinking uh, to yourself, these terrorists are just the root of evil. They, they are so bad. How can they hurt and, and kill so many people? They don't have a conscience. But is this the case or is it also partly due to the situation in which these, uh, these uh, people find themselves? Um, so this core question of understanding human behavior and putting them in certain situations that triggers extreme behavior, that is also has been very appealing to social psychologists as well. And um, there are very famous experiments, for example, the Milgram experiment that you're probably uh, already a bit familiar with. We're going to be talking uh, lengthy about it later in this course, so I'm not going to dive into it right now. But this is also an example of an experiment in which people showed really extreme behavior. And the question is then, is this a person or is this, what is the power of a situation? Um, another question that social psychology addresses is how a person experience, experiences a situation. Because this can really differ per person. And this is the core idea of Gestalt uh, psychology. Um, and you're probably familiar with uh, these types of, uh, of uh, pictures. So in the middle, you can either see two people that are nearly kissing or you can see a vase. And what you see really uh, differs per person and both is correct. So it's, and the same goes for the other two pictures. You can see, uh, for example, on the very uh, uh, left, you can see either an old uh, woman or you can see a young woman, depending on your perspective. Um, and both is true. So it really depends on your own interpretation of a situation. You can experience uh, these pictures in different ways. And in the same way, people can experience social situations very differently. And this can also lead to a lot of miscommunication and, and problems. So the idea of Gestalt psychology is that um, um, is the, the subjective way in which an object appears in people's mind is, uh, is studied. Um, so the, I, the problem with humans is that we find it very hard to uh, accept the idea that both perspectives can be right. And for Gestalt psychology, for the face and the, and the kissing people, then we feel, feel like, oh yeah, okay, I see it now. I see that both, both is true. But for our social worlds and decisions we make in our social worlds, we are often convinced that the way that we perceive our environment is the real way, is the only way. Um, and uh, this is also what is referred to as naive realism. We tend to underestimate how much we are interpreting uh, or spinning basically what we see. And uh, this is also something, of course, you see a lot uh, in, in, uh, in politics, uh, the root of a lot of political arguments, but also in relationships. You can, have, you're, you can be very convinced that your perspective is correct. And this battle over who is right and who is wrong is really at the core of many problems uh, that humans face. And uh, the, the, the irony is that oftentimes there's no right or wrong in these situations because both perspectives are equally valuable and equally true. So we spin the situation in such a way that is beneficial for us. We spin the uh, situation in such a way that we feel comfortable with. But why do we do this? Well, for, in order to understand that, it is important to understand two very basic human motives. Um, these are human motives that help us understand why people do what they do. 
First of all, there's the self-enhancement motive. And this is the motive, the motivation that we all have to feel good about ourselves. We want to protect our self-esteem, we want to protect our self-view and, and experience ourselves as valuable people. And because we have this motive to feel good about ourselves, we spin the social world in such a way that is beneficial for us. At the same time, we also have an accuracy motive. And this means that we also want to be accurate. So we do have this desire to be correct. And sometimes, actually quite often, these two uh, motives are competing with each other. And um, how does our brain solve this? Well, we are actually very uh, well able to change um, and, and, and sort of interpret a social situation in such a way that we feel like that we are either uh, at the same time protecting our self-esteem and at the other time also being accurate. And this is um, uh, where illusions come in, so that people are often uh, very optimistic about their own behavior. They're very optimistic about their chances in life. And I'm going to give you some examples of that right now. So first of all, uh, the first illusion that we have, basically, the way we sort of lie to ourselves and spin the situation in a beneficial way, is that we often experience that we are better than average. So if you ask a person, for example, a random person, uh, how good of a driver are you? And considering this person actually has his or her driver license, a lot of people would say, I'm a little bit better than average. I'm not the best driver in the world. I'm also definitely not the worst, and I'm, I think I'm just slightly over average. And this not only uh, uh, happens when you ask them about their driving uh, potential, but also, for example, if you ask students, so how good of a student are you? A lot of students will say, I'm, I'm just slightly better than average. And of course, this is ironic because not everybody can be better than average because then the average would be higher. So it doesn't make any sense, but a lot of people have this misconception about their own capacities. We are also unrealistically optimistic. For example, we overestimate um, the, the, the chances of winning the lottery and we underestimate the chances of getting sick. Uh, we also saw this happening during the COVID uh, pandemic that a lot of people underestimated their chances of getting uh, the virus, which also led to a lot of problematic behaviors. Um, well, if you look at um, the rates, for example, the chance for you to win the lottery is actually 300 times smaller than the chance of you dying in a car accident. This, this, these art, odds are not very good. They're not in our favor, and we tend to ignore it. So we, we tend to be realistic and, opt uh, sorry, we tend to be optimistic about uh, how our, our world uh, and our life is going to treat us. Uh, these are all ways our brain works to, to sort of protect our self-view. Other illusions that we have is the false consensus effect and the false uniqueness effect. Um, so what this means is that for uh, some attributes, some traits that we have, we might be aware uh, that these traits are actually not so good. They might actually be sometimes a little bit problematic. So let's imagine you know for yourself that you tend to be a bit lazy. Uh, then what we then often do is use the false consensus effect. And with the false consensus effect, we mean that we have the tendency to overestimate how common this trait is. So we say, yes, I'm a bit lazy. I like to sleep in. I tend to be late. But, you know, everybody likes to be late. Everybody likes to sleep in. So this is not uh, unique. This is something that is the same for everybody. False consensus. Our bad traits uh, is something that everybody has. So it's not a big deal. Uh, on the opposite, if something, if we know that we have a very good trait, maybe you're very uh, athletic and you like sports a lot, then you might, uh, uh, oh, uh, you probably uh, underestimate how common this is. So you tend to say, yes, well, I'm very athletic, I'm very sporty, not a lot of people are as sporty, sporty as I am. So we interpret our traits and how common they are also in a, in a very positive way, in such a way that protects our self-esteem and the way we feel about ourselves. We'll talk more about um, uh, the self and the way we, we sort of try to maintain our self-esteem in, uh, in, um, in a lecture later on in the course. Thanks.